student loan ombudsman, leading the Bureau's efforts on student lending. Uh, he also holds a BA from Harvard and an MBA from the Wharton School. Robert Weissman is president of Public Citizen. Uh, previously, he worked as director of the corporate accountability organization, Essential Action. Before that, he was the editor of the Multinational Monitor, a magazine that tracks multinational companies, and he worked as an attorney at the Center for the Study of Responsive Law. Uh, he also holds a JD from Harvard Law. Uh, today will be a fireside chat style conversation, and it is open to the press. Uh, throughout the conversation, please enter your questions into the chat. Uh, the Zoom is webinar style, so I'll be able to see your questions, although they won't be visible to everyone. I will try to ask as many as possible when we get to the end, so please keep sending your questions in throughout. And finally, we are streaming this event, and if you'd like a link to the recording afterwards, please let me know. Uh, so with that, I want to hand the virtual mic over to Rob Weissman to kick us off. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Lisa, and, and thanks to everyone joining us. I want to echo Lisa and appreciating our supporters for joining us and um, marking uh, the, our 50th anniversary. This is the first in a series of conversations we're going to have with leading regulators and government officials. And as Lisa said, we're really excited that this initial conversation is with Director Rova Chopra of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. If we weren't living in the COVID period, this fireside chat would be actually be in person by our fireside in the public citizen headquarters building. Uh, but the upside of doing it virtually is we get to have people from around the country. So we try to make a, a virtue out of necessity. Uh, the conversation today is gonna be really mostly Director Chopra speaking with a few questions for me, prodding him along the way. Um, and uh, we're gonna start with some general, sort of framework thinking about what's going on at the CFPB and then sort of dive down in some particular hot button issues that are going on. So with that, uh, Director Trevor, let me just thank you again for joining us and just start off, you know, you're now 11 years into the existence of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And as you reflect back on that time and then looking forward, what, what have you learned about what's working at the CFPB and what, and what hasn't worked so well? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, still so terrific to see what the place has accomplished already, but there's really so much more that really needs to be done. And in some ways, I think when I reflect on um, where we are, the CFPB is no longer a you know new scrappy agency. It is um, you know punching at the same level as the big banking regulators that we've had since the Civil War and since uh, you know the passage of the Federal Reserve Act. And I think when it comes to policing the economy and making sure that there is fair dealing in the market, um, we're on the hook. Um, and we have to be the financial first responders. Um, if there's changes in the economy or if people are subjected to systemic abuse, and I think um, we have to live up to that. There's a lot of things that have been unfinished business from the, the enactment of the agency, um, and we're still pushing forward to making those a reality. What would you say have been the big successes you want to you know, keep emulating and expanding on going forward? Well, I think one key piece has always, always been the fact that we knew that um, the attention that the regulators paid to the non-bank sector was very, very limited, very, very dispersed. And there was clear that there was a lot of risk there, both to the financial system and to the consumers themselves. So what I think the agency has already done to build some basic accountability for mortgage servicers, for credit reporting companies, I think that's been a piece that doesn't get much attention, but has been hugely influential. And I think, you know, I would be remiss if we did not really talk a lot about what we have done to make sure that the core products um, mortgage, auto, student loan, and credit card, you know, the regulators of the past really missed some of the major issues that those markets were facing because many of them were more concerned about ensuring that banks were profitable. And I think our singular focus um, has made sure that 
that is changing fundamentally. I could go on too about everything that has happened in the student loan market about really making sure that loan servicing there is working better or what we've done um, for members of the military and the veteran community. So I, I would say in terms of places where I worry about are we doing enough is are we really ready to respond quickly and aggressively if there are sudden changes in the economy? Um, we have really tried to reboot our entire market monitoring and make sure that it is, is world-class. I also think that um, we inherited a system from the Federal Reserve Board of very, very complicated regulations that really in many ways seem designed to fit the business models of the largest institutions rather than having more um, clear, bright lines um, that are harder to lawyer around. So there, there's a lot of things that we're shifting to. I, I continue to worry also about institutions that repeatedly violate the law and, and really see um, the fines as a cost of doing business. And, and I think that's a place that's a big challenge that we're looking to confront. Well, you, you touched on a time that I want to pursue. Uh, let me ask you sort of one more big picture question before diving into some of these individual pieces. As you look out, I mean, your, your tenure doesn't last there for 10 years. Um, but as you look out 10 years, what are you, what are you looking as, as where there are emerging areas of concern and where you want to see the agency positioned in advance of problems developing? Yeah, I think that the, the main problem we've seen with a lot of regulators is they sort of watch from the sidelines as there's things coming through and kind of stare at it rather than really engage. And that to me, we are seeing financial services totally being transformed by technology and particularly by entry by large technology platforms. Um, I think the Facebook Libra proposal was a huge wake up call globally to finance ministers, central bank governors, consumer regulators, privacy regulators. And it was a lesson that if the regulators just watch from the sidelines, there could be enormous implications and widespread harm. Now, Libra didn't happen, but we have to make sure that we're, what technology we're seeing develop, whether it's much more advanced use of algorithms in, in underwriting, whether it's tracking and surveillance of our payments data, whether it's new types of products structured in ways that remind people of more complex ones and derivatives. That's the place where we have to make sure we're not waiting for harm to occur and have to be doing something now about it. So in 10 years, if the CFPB has not figured out how to make sure that technology is developing in a way that truly makes services better, consumers better off, and has a competitive landscape, if it's all just controlled by a handful of large tech companies, I think we will have failed. Let me put off for just a moment the, the tech companies and, and go back to one of the themes you highlighted, which is that is, is, your, is your ticking off these key areas of if the agency's work, you know, so much of it involves consumer debt. Um, and I think as a sort of global matter, we saw sort of debt levels decline during the pandemic, but they're, they're, they're ticking up again now, it seems like both because of changing economic conditions, but also the sort of the in so-called innovation of, of new kinds of, of products and approaches and, and, and uh, lending deals from a variety of different kinds of businesses. So sort of looking back you know, on the experience, but then thinking forward, like as you think about debt, not in any particular not in a particular area, but sort of generally with these new products coming online, these new approaches, sometimes old ones and new and new uh, dressing. How do you think the CFPB should be positioned with like a framework to deal to control abuses and make sure that debt is working for consumers and and not uh, against them? Yeah, I mean, 
a core way we look at it is obviously when is innovation largely about exploiting um, or arbitraging around existing law? And when is it using meaningful technology to really use information in ways that really help people? And I think a lot of what you see in the marketplace, and I hear it from investors all the time, is you'll see firms Call, brand themselves as a fintech in order to raise capital when they don't actually have any unique technology. It's often just, you know, they've got a website or an app. So we actually want to look exactly at the product, at the offering, and really what's the right, what's, what's the baseline of protections that already exist and, and, and make sure there's some parity around it. Another key place we want to constantly be thinking as to what extent is massive data collection and surveillance integrated into a so-called innovation. And I think that's a place where the ways in which um, there is thirst for our transaction data to be linked up with other types of data, the power that that gives a firm over are uh, over the choices that we even see, that has a lot of implications for really how people borrow, how people pay off loans, how people experience the system. So I think I would, I would go to thinking about regulatory parity, um, you know, just like it, brick and mortar and, on, and online, but also identifying the ways that we create innovation by um, removing blockades to competition um, and, and also constantly be thinking again about data. Um, you certainly uh, in your time there prioritized and very recently so also the issue of, of junk fees. What do you mean when you're talking about junk fees? Why, why, why you made it a priority? How, how consequential is it for for consumers and what are you trying to do about it? Yeah, I think this is an issue really across the economy where firms have figured out about how to get a customer in the door, but not monetize them through a, a true upfront price, but really to muddle the true cost through, through backend fees. And, you know, we have an issue with junk fees that provide no service whatsoever. Sometimes their cost has absolutely no relationship to the cost to provide it. And sometimes there's actually no service at all. So where people are experiencing this often is, again, well after they've signed up, um, and where it's not necessarily easy to switch. So we're looking really broadly, what are the ways in which there can be more competition on fees? How can we make it easier for, for consumers to take their business elsewhere? And really kind of going back to some of the basics of making sure that, especially in banking, the people are getting some real service for what they're paying for. We've looked at this in debt collector pay to pay fees. We're looking at credit card late fees and a whole host of other fees too. And I just think this is really critical to make sure that markets are competing on customer service, on product quality and on price, but really upfront price. Well, just take that example of the late fees for, for credit cards. So you're saying that you, you get charged whatever you get charged for, for paying a day late or two weeks late. And, and I guess the idea is that that has no correlation to the actual cost to the credit card company. And then what's, and what can you do about that? I mean, you, the CFPB, not, not you, the consumer. Well, the, the Credit Card Act by, by, by law requires that penalties be reasonable and proportional to the violation. So we have inherited a 
bevy of rules from the Federal Reserve Board and from the Federal Trade Commission that transferred to the CFPB. And so we're looking at a lot of them. And the Fed, uh, when it put in these rules in place to restrict um, and implement the requirement that fees be reasonable and proportional, they included an immunity provision. And there was full immunity from enforcement if um, you know, credit card companies had, had a flat fee. And that number has jumped up and up and up and up by inflation. And in many cases, you know, are people getting hit with late fees? Rather than that being a, a simple deterrent, are some credit card companies building that in as a core revenue driver? And that's what we're really looking at to determine how should we revisit that Fed rule and its, its immunity provisions for credit card issuers. Another one of your priorities and something that we've talked about for a long time at Public Citizen is dealing with repeat offenders, corporations that, that break the law once, may or may not get penalized for it, and then do it again. Um, you made that a big issue in your term at the Federal Trade Commission and, and you're focusing on it now. How do you see that issue? And, and, and again, beyond sort of just critiquing it, that's what we're really good at. What, what are you able to do about it? Yeah, so a, a few things. One, we have actually really refocused a lot of our enforcement energies on repeat offenders. Um, we have filed lawsuits on a number of very large actors, including TransUnion, First Cash, which is one of the nation's largest pawn lenders. Um, you know, there's, there's a list goes on. And I think what we're trying to get to is a world where it's not just cost of business penalties, because the challenge with that is that the small players, um, when, they, when, when they get hit with an uh, enforcement action, regulators are really quick to shut them down to and often prosecute criminally their executives. And then for large firms, there, there's, I don't, it's not written down. There just appears to be a code that there's a different way that they're approached. And I think that ha that's very, very problematic in terms of equal justice under the law. So there's a few things we're doing here. One, we're actually really looking at the set of remedies that we're going to seek, including we've talked about um, the law authorizes to seek limitations on their future business practices, real limits on them, rather than just sort of we're going to pay redress and a penalty. Also looking much more at individuals when it comes to repeat offenders. And, you know, in, our, in, in one of the litigations I mentioned, we have personally named um, a longtime executive, um, but also looking broadly at the other legal tools that exist for repeat, addressing repeat offenders. In the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, um, there is also the option of pursuing revocation of their deposit insurance. You know, there is real things that are on the books today that just haven't been used. And I think when it comes to business limitations, individual accountability, and, and a whole host of other issues, regulators have often um, shied away from it because the, often the incentives of regulators is to be able to parade about all of the you know, penalties they've collected. But I don't know if we're succeeding if it's just happening over and over and over again. It's gonna take a while to really change the dynamic there but our staff is considering a host of new provisions to pursue in court or in settlement that moves away from this reliance on just a civil penalty. Um, and, and, and I think we are going to be thinking about how would they change their own consumer contract terms? How would they actually, might they be limited uh, altogether on growth of certain business segments or participation in new business segments, all of this 
can, it can be is quite reasonable um, for those who engage in just repeat violations. And obviously it all depends on the facts and the circumstances, but the business as usual approach is completely unfair to smaller players. Yeah, that, that's certainly very exciting for us to hear. Um, now, I know you've been including in your time previously at the FTC making the argument that you just made that it's not just a matter of protecting consumers and having a, a, appropriate accountability. It's really fairness. It's a, doing this is really ensuring fairness for the especially small companies, but even for larger companies that are that are following the law. Um, I have to say, even though I find you very compelling on that, I haven't seen a lot of receptivity from the business side. Do you feel like there's any way to break through on that? Or I mean, are you just still seeing pushback, sort of reflexive pushback against real accountability for wrongdoers? Actually, I have from when I talk to, you know, in the past month, I've probably talked to hundreds of executives of community banks and credit unions. And it's not uncommon to hear that they'll say, if we screw up, our business could end. And I think that they often feel that there's new regulations created, mostly because large firms engaged in repeated misconduct. And rather than truly addressing that, um, there becomes economy wide. And, and I think they have a point there. Um, that's not to say I do think consumers need kind of equal protection, regardless of really where they're going and who they're doing their business with. But there is something that if you look at the SNL uh, scandals of the past, real big differences when it came to how they treated small firms, a lot of individual executive prosecutions, a lot of those firms no longer exist but a much, much more tender approach with others. So all I'm trying to do is just create some parity audit. Um, I don't know, I can't speak to receptivity or I hear a lot of receptivity, but of course, um, you know, no one really wants, uh, I think a marketplace where the enforcement agencies give totally different treatment to some over the others. And I, I felt when I was at the Federal Trade Commission, case after case, you would look at the fact pattern, to almost identical, and the treatment of small firms was extremely punitive. Um, and the treatment to larger firms was really um, just kind of tender and loving often. Um, I wanted to ask you about a, a specific issue, which which I know you're familiar with, which is the use of a forced arbitration and class action bans in, in consumer financial contracts. When the Dodd-Frank law was passed, it created the CFPB, it gave the agency specific authority to do a study um, looking at that issue and then to issue rules to, to restrict or ban the use of forced arbitration provisions. And, and also, as you know, the agency did do that and did issue a rule um, prohibiting at least the use of class action bans. And then Congress overrode that rule through the Congressional Review Act. Um, but, but your agency still has the authority um, to issue that rule. And um, we, for, you know, as, as you know, since we, along with an, uh, more than 100 organizations, just wrote you yesterday about this, uh, it's been, it seemed like a really big priority to us. Um, as important as all the enforcement work you do and the agency does, especially under your tenure, um, you can't possibly do everything that individual consumers can do um, or can do collectively in a decentralized way. And, and you know, we may not have in the future uh, an agency director as aggressive as, as you've been. And if we protect the ability of consumers to hold institutions accountable, we have a real ongoing, permanent, systemic and structural way to to hold financial institutions accountable. So with all that said, uh, what do you see the agency doing going forward in, the, in this space of, of forced arbitration? Well, we did receive your letter uh, yesterday. We will, we will talk further about it with you, but I think here's sort of where I come out on things is that we do see that the markets um, that do have uh, some private, 
ways for consumers to hold businesses accountable. We see that as very valuable. I mean, it, it exists, especially in, in the credit reporting context, the debt collection context. There's no, it's very clear from what we just talked about in terms of repeat offenders that existing public enforcement is not enough of a deterrent. And so, as you said, you know, the Congress did um, override that rule and we are prohibited from doing a substantially similar rule. Um, we are thinking about this issue quite a bit with respect to repeat offenders. Um, and, and more broadly, but no specific plans um, as of now. That being said, we are looking at not just, uh, we're looking at all sorts of contractual clauses that are put um, in consumer contracts and often in ways that, um, you know, are not negotiated, are not subject to normal competitive processes and looking at ways to how to you know, promote fairness, transparency, and competition on that front. But um, you know, I do believe that the rule that was put into place, um, but then overturned was based on a very rigorous study. Um, and it was uh, something that I think could have been, as I understand it, pretty beneficial to the market. Um, but we'll continue to obviously look at all of these and figure out um, what the path forward is. Yeah, I know that you know this, but I'll, I'll remind everybody who's um, listening and watching, some of whom may not, the, the study that the CFPB did on this was by far the most comprehensive study ever done on the issue. And there were volumes and volumes and more than a thousand pages, but the, the, the single core finding was basically, if you're a consumer and you've got a forced arbitration provision in your contract, you're out of luck when you're ripped off. You are not going to be able to get redress. You can't sue in court. That's what the contract says. You, and, and practically, you have no real opportunity to bring an individual arbitration case. So you're just basically taken and that's it. Um, well, I know we were not anticipating you making a grand announcement on this issue in, in this conversation, although that would have been nice. <laughs> um, but we do want to en encourage you to, to focus in on, on this one. Um, we think it's not hard to work around the problem of the, of the uh, Congressional Review Act, and especially for sort of a durable rule after your time. Um, I can't think that, of anything that's going to be more important. Well, and we also know that um, financial institutions continue uh, on a regular basis to take consumers to court. Um, and so that is something that uh, is, does not go unnoticed. Um, I wanted to leap back into the, the issue of big tech that you that you highlighted, um, both in terms of thinking of sort of you know what we call the big tech companies, the four or five giant corporations, but also as you were talking about this whole idea of fintech, this sort of merger of finance and, and new technology. Um, and you you know you you've really taken the agency, um, put it in the forefront and exam calling out this issue and highlighting it. And you started to touch on this idea of the intersection of of finance and data surveillance. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that for what, for what you're seeing happening and what it, what it means for, for consumers um, and what kinds of things are, are happening now and what kind of things you're worrying about going forward in this space. Yeah, we really have a history in this country of um, for a number of industries that we see as a, a infrastructure of our economy and society. Um, we've always had laws and regulations to try and prevent um, some of the conflicts of interest that can occur in the telecommunications space. Um, you know, even the uh, old landlines, you were prohibited as a carrier from essentially kind of spying and monetizing on your customers' calls. Um, the point being that you have such deep insight into that person that you having a side business to help monetize that just creates an inherent conflict. And in banking, there has long been this separation between banking and commerce. 
the idea that um, when you commingle that, you create some conflicts. And, and I, I think what we see happening outside of the regulated banking system, but to a degree inside of it as well, um, the chartered banking system, you are starting to see this blurry line between finance and commerce, and it, you especially see it in the payments area. So how people are trying to take the payment data and really combining it with all sorts of other information to be able to potentially advantage um, some of their the rest of their conglomerate um, or the extent that it gives them a lot of power to, to pick and choose winners and losers in the system. I, I see this as much broader than financial privacy, though that's a, a key piece of it. Um, and so to what extent is all of this data harvesting, you know, we talk about the, the need for all of this data being combined does create value, but who's, who gets it? Is it just a few or is it really all consumers? Is it the whole system that benefits from it? So I think we have to, we're, we're, we're looking, we, we, we have a, a financial privacy law that we enforce, but we also really, if there is one kind of federal um, protection of, of our information, it's the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which obviously covers much more than financial services. And I think some of the issues that took place over 50 years ago, we're starting to see again. And we're looking at how to use those tools, but more broadly, we're trying to um, get to the bottom of where are the tech firm's aspirations and how might that play out over the next decade? I think you hinted at this earlier, and I just wanted to ask you to um, elaborate on the degree to which you see this as a worry or whether you see there's actually some consumer benefit. I mean, one of the ways that all this data can be used is not just, as, as you said, not just to advantage the firm that acquires all the data, um, but also possibly to, to injure consumers uh, in, in sort of offering discriminatory services or, or prices or many other things. Discriminatory in terms of any kind of market segment based on income or geography, but also discriminatory um, is people most, most likely think about it in terms of race. So I'm just wondering what you're thinking about sort of the, this nexus of issue around surveillance, uh, racial discrimination, uh, algorithms that either by design or inadvertently further perpetuate uh, racial inequality? Well, one, we've tried to make crystal clear that you can't uh, not observe existing law just because your algorithm is fancy and you don't understand it. So you're required under law when you deny someone credit, for example, to give a statement of reasons as to why. And in other words, you really can't be using technology that is so opaque that you can't comply with that. So I think you raised though, um, with respect to discrimination, I, I really thought that Secretary Carson's complaint filed against Facebook related to housing discrimination was an interesting roadmap for how a lot of regulators um, may look at it regardless of who is in power. I think there's a lot of consensus that that analytical approach of um, making sure there's accountability um, in the decision-making process whether it's an algorithm, machine learning, however it's marketed. So that is something that we're, digital redlining is something we're really growing as a capability to suss out and detect. And um, at the same time, you know, we think there, there are obviously benefits of using data and technology. We're gonna be proposing some rules 
that will give consumers more ability to kind of get their data, permission it in ways that, you know, they can get more leverage for different products, different services that suit them. I think that we know that that's just one of many things that need to be addressed when it comes to the use of, of big data, um, monetization, sharing, and the like. Great. Well, I just want to take a moment to highlight for um, the folks watching. I'm going to ask two questions or maybe two more sets of questions. Um, and then we're going to turn it over to, to Lisa to run the moderated conversation. So please put your questions in the chat. You've got fair notice. Here we go. Back to our program. Um, you have done a lot. You talked about this a lot at the FTC and have done a lot at the CFPB to deal with the, the issue of the revolving door. There's a lot of competition in this space for which set of agencies are the most egregious in terms of revolving door. But I think the, the financial regula regulators have a good case to be made that they're the worst in terms of people going from the agencies, going to regulated industry and back again. How, how do you see that issue just as, as a priority um, at the agency you're working on and to, to watch for and what kind of protections are you putting in place to deal with a revolving door? Yeah, so obviously, um... You know, the, the Federal Reserve System, other regulators have dealt with challenges recently related to trading, um, a host of issues. And I think the where I, I approach the issue of revolving door misconduct and revolving door fraud is that, again, it kind of comes down to um, we do not want to create a scenario where more um, well-heeled, well-financed firms can get a different outcome based on the same set of facts, or will they can get privileged access to information before their smaller competitors or before the public at large. So I do think there are some hard questions, and I've had a number of conversations with a broad range of perspectives on this. There are issues to me in the legal profession when it comes to ethics. And I think the misuse of confidential information that one gleans in at, while serving in a government agency is a concern. It's very, very difficult to police. We have tried to make very clear here at the CFPB, our staff will report ex-employees that may be misusing confidential information. They will report in some ways inappropriate contacts. And it's very, very critical as a cultural matter for every agency staff to know that they should not be sharing information with their former colleagues. Um, in the law, the Federal Reserve, FDIC, OCC, their examiners are actually, you know, have a statutory prohibition on kind of going to work for the entities that they supervised. You know, I personally favor broadening some of that. Um, I would favor um, restrictions on people who sit in my seat from doing that. I, I think that's one of the many things we can do I think to restore some of the trust um, and, the, and, and, and get rid of some of the favoritism. And I, it's interesting, I, I don't see it really as a problem at the CFPB, um, but I want us to model really best in class when it comes to that, that any firm subject to an examination and investigation, you know, their, their lawyers that they hire should get the same treatment regardless, um, you know, if they worked in the government or not before. And I was quite, I was quite influenced by the severity of problems at the Federal Trade Commission, which had a deep, pernicious, revolving door culture that uh, I found in many instances confidential information being inappropriately shared. Um, in non-public settings and in ways that I think allowed um, 
advantages to someone's private sector career that they could monetize uh, information they gained while serving in public service. Thank you for that. Um, well, I referenced earlier the letter that we and 100 other consumer groups sent you yesterday. Um, you also received a letter two days ago um, from a different group, from a number of Republican senators. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you wanted to reply to that. Um, they accused you of running a lawless and unaccountable agency, said you launched, you launched a relentless smear campaign against banks that offer uh, optional overdraft fees to their customers and blamed you for pursuing name and shame, name and shaming tactics to pressure companies with what you've called junk fees. Um, I don't know if you want to reply to that, um, but we wanted to put it on the table for you to do we, so. We, 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 are, we are reviewing their letter. I guess I, the only thing I would say is that um, it, it, it's interesting that there has not been, um, well, privately, you hear so many concerns in the conversations across the, across the political spectrum about where we are um, as, a, as a society and the economy when it comes to technology. And the concerns that I hear across the board, um, especially related to some of the issues we've talked about, repeat offenders, big tech, um, these are things that I think there's really broad agreement on. So maybe this is a, a little Pollyanna, but I'm more upbeat that there's gonna be places that um, and, and issues that will will continue to be worked on regardless. So uh, uh, th that may be too hopeful, but we're going to keep doing our work, um, you know, re regardless of the false accusations that are made about our staff here. Great, um, well, Lisa. Let me bounce it over to you to take any of the questions that have been submitted. Great. Thanks, Rob. And thanks to you both. This has been a really fun and, and interesting conversation to, to listen to. And we do have a lot of great questions in the chat, but I uh, want to take a minute to encourage anyone who has a burning question that has not yet typed it in to, to do so now. Um, there have been a couple of questions in the chat, uh, the latest coming from Kate Berry, um, about what the CFPB is doing to crack down on fraud, specifically in P2P payments like Zelle and, and PayPal. You know, uh, what can you guys do to ensure consumers are, are safe? Um, so love to start there. Yeah, we're actually looking at a host of issues related to this big uptick, I think in fraud, scams, hacks. Um, a couple of things I'd say. One is we do see a rise um, in much of the developed world once real-time payments are adopted. The US is very late to really uh, moving to real-time payments. And I think because there's not really that moment to hold or freeze or take back funds, um, the way in which individuals can be defrauded is it's becoming difficult to crack down. And frankly, the sophistication um, of some of these tactics has, has really, really grown. And I think a lot of us like to think we could never be taken by some of this, but when you really talk to individuals about it, the level of sophistication um, and technology used is, is, is really frightening. So um, we have been talking to a lot of institutions and a lot of um, stakeholders about how should the framework of the Electronic Fund Transfer Act apply to the P2P players and payment providers? What's the differences in which how small banks and large banks are dealing with it? What are some of the small things we can do to make sure that consumer rights when it comes to getting um, you know, an investigation into an error or potential fraud are adhered to. So I don't have an immediate answer um, other than we're very concerned about that how the levels are increasing. Um, we wanna make sure that people really know where to go for help. And we have ordered um, some of the large payment systems, you know, including 
um, you know, Venmo, Cash App, a lot of the names that you know, Google Pay, Apple Pay, to really understand what they're doing on this front. Um, we've issued those orders late last year and are continuing to see um, where we take it. Fantastic. Um, so I want to turn to a question from Heather Booth, which uh, many may know was very involved in the push for Dodd-Frank and the creation of the CFPB. Um, she starts by just appreciating your leadership and, and has two questions. Um, just what can we do to support your work from the outside? And is there one particular focus that, that you think um, outside groups should campaign on or, or focus on to be helpful? I think it, it's so useful to try and make sure that individuals are really getting help. And I think in, you know, there's so many issues that people could advocate on. I think when people see how the CFPB's consumer complaint system is working, and I know that organizations that actually do direct service, um, They've used that system to sometimes even save people from really serious trouble. And so I want to make sure that our consumer help and consumer complaint system is really helping all corners of the country. And we're looking to make sure that they're better reflective of, um, you know, the population that we serve. And I, I do think... Um, I do think that it is important as we confront the challenges with technology. Um, this is felt in healthcare. This is felt in, in so many key education, so many key verticals of society and the economy. Um, we really need to make sure that there is a focused effort to be able to make sure that those, those firms are also held accountable and I think that that's something that the public um, continues to learn more and more and more sectors of the economy realize that sometimes disruption creates a lot of benefits, but we need to make sure that those benefits, again, are subject to fairness, transparency, and, and vigorous competition too. So I, I got to think more of an answer on that question, but I, I I think that's where my head immediately starts. It's really helpful and, and a good place for us to think about on the outside. Um, a sort of similar question or a follow on from Meredith Hankins um, about the petition process to the CFPB, um, just where you all are most eager to see rulemaking petitions submitted. And if you have any advice for submitting a successful petition for rulemaking. Yeah, so I, I, I don't want to prompt any of them. I, I think there's no shortage of topics. What I think I'd like to see a big area is we did a review of our innovation programs. And the result was a, that some of the ways in which it was done amounted to picking winners and losers. So a companies would lobby for it and they would get a regulatory exemption. And in some cases, we found that they may not even have been complying with the terms of the agreement that we had with them. So what I would like to see is uh, we're going to be announcing um, over the course of the next few months a number of initiatives that if we want to shape um, how the environment works so that there can be new products and services. Let's make it so that it's applicable to a broad category of players rather than just kind of crowning one, um, you know, one company with the ability to do it. It, open, it, it just opens up the door for a lot of cronyism and favoritism. And again, goes back to this thing about hiring ex-employees to be able to navigate through the process. This has to be out in the open. Um, so really that's a place where we're hoping to work with a lot of these firms and, and really see where that, 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 that we can get guidance and rules that is broadly applicable, not just to one. 
I'd also say in terms of advice, we do think that it is useful to be able to provide um, a whole host of data, whether it's quantitative data, whether it's um, stories, whether it's qualitative assessments, to be able to understand what is the issue with a particular rule or regulation and how might changing it really have impact in ways that are, are broadly beneficial. So I don't think it, it's, it, it, we, we do, we do um, have a team here who will try their best to kind of answer some of those questions, but I think having some of that clarity of not just do something, but what specifically should we do? I think that's, oh, that's usually tends to be a little bit more um, focusing on how we can potentially take action. Fantastic. Um, so a couple of questions have touched on um, messaging, and I think this could be a question for both of you. Um, how do you all think that consumer protection is thought of nowadays? How does the public um, perceive consumer protection and then has it impacted your mission at the agency and our mission at Public Citizen? Yeah, it's actually interesting. I think in some ways, um, the word we popular, very much popularized, I think in the 1970s, you know, the concept of consumer protection, um, one challenge that I notice is that a lot of things are not, we, we, we don't self-identify often as a consumer. You know, we may also be kind of an employee. We may also, you know, be a, a parent. A, a, there's all sorts of ways in which we approach the markets rather than just necessarily as a purchaser. Um, and I think we've tried to make sure we're understanding the breadth of all of it. And really what it comes down to is fair dealing. Fair dealing for everyone involved, including law-abiding businesses that shouldn't be disadvantaged, as well as for no matter where people are um, in their kind of personal identity. So I, I also think there's a lot more attention, Lisa, to asymmetries of, of information and power. So it's not simply about, um, you know, traditional disclosures and, 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 and that is very important, but really what's the context in which someone is making a choice? And in, in some places we know that they don't have any choice at all. You don't get to usually choose who your loan servicer is. You don't. We don't have a. Uh, we don't really opt in to people collecting and reporting data about us. You know, there's this example after example of this, and so I think uh, there that is that is an evolving school of of thought. And I would just add one more comment, which is that a lot of the economic models and assumptions around kind of um, buyers and sellers um, don't always apply very well when it comes to individuals um, kind of looking for products and services for, for family or household purposes. So I think that's, that's, a, that's an evolving way of where we need to get to a more robust analytical approach. Um, well, I'll just go real quick and echo, I think, a lot of what Director Chopper just said that I think is important for all of us, it's for, important for us as public citizens that we think about consumer protection. Um, and, and, and especially in our 50th year and sort of thinking back about our, tra our traditions, our origins, and, and how that stuff moves forward. I think that sometimes either the term consumer or the term consumer protection has been either hijacked or really narrowed. Um, I really think it's important what the CFPB is doing exactly as Director Tripper was saying to try to recover the concepts. So a lot of the agencies, I don't think outside groups, but a lot of the agencies over the decades have narrowed consumer protection to often focus on just kind of the worst sort of scams um, and ripoffs that everybody's against, but don't, but and thereby ignore a lot of these structural features in the economy 
uh, in the competition feature of the economy that Director Troper was talking about. And the other thing I think that's happened, and this has been very intentional um, by the corporate lobbies, is to sort of talk about an empowered consumer and a, and a model of an empowered consumer that has nothing, to, is, is, is you were just saying, kind of deals with some theoretical sense where the consumer is out on their own, they know what they're doing, and they have choices. Everything is about like, you get to choose what you want. And that's how, that's both good for you as a consumer and that's good for us as society and as an economy. And doesn't look at the ways that consumers really shouldn't be isolated, should be able to band together, don't have choice because they're subjected to structural forces and, and, and ongoing sort of corporate power, corporate limitations, corporate pricing power, um, corporate anti-competitive activity, and so on. And so I think part of our challenge is to re-energize the idea of what it means to be a consumer, not to let it be so narrowly defined, so individualized, and to have a much more expansive sense of what consumer protection means, um, exactly as Director Tripper was saying and, and is carrying out in practice. And Lisa, just as a one other bigger picture point is that we also try and it's not just protect consumers. We also want individuals having more of a voice in their government. So you raise the petition process. You know, you should not need to hire a bunch of lawyers to be able to exercise your constitutional right to petition the government. You know, we should, we're trying to put all of this out in the open for everyone to weigh in on. And I think constantly, if we wanna make sure it's responsive to really the broad set of issues that we face, finding out how we can make these processes easier and how the agencies can be accountable to our consumer complaints, to what people are weighing in on. Um, and, and that's part of, I think, making sure that the, the real um, need for consumer protection is, is ultimately carried out. Fantastic answers both um, and taking us right to time. So we will also treat those as your closing remarks. Um, I really want to thank you both for this conversation. It's just been illuminating, fascinating, and helpful. Um, apologies to anyone whose question I did not get to. Um, I'll make sure they get to um, Director Chopra's team, um, as well as to President Weissman, and, and we'll hope to answer some of them later. Um, again, uh, you know, if you are interested in the recording, let me know. I'll make sure that you get it. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone again uh, for joining us for this first of many pieces of celebration during Public Citizen's 50th year. Uh, but thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you so much again. And um, best wishes as your as your celebrations continue. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody.